Today's lesson is on preparing job estimate and costing. And we have two um, learning objectives. Identify nature scope or nature or scope of work and prepare and present an estimate. So what are the types of product costing? So we have the process costing. Uh, a company produces many units of a single product. One unit of product is indistinguishable from other units of product. And then the identical nature of each uh, unit of product enables assigning the same average, average cost per unit. So the process costing, and we will understand that better. We have here some examples. So some sample companies, we have the Weyerhaeuser Paper Manufacturing, Reynolds Aluminum, Refining Aluminum, and then Coca-Cola mixing beverages they uh, they are using the process costing because they are processing their products on their own then we also have the job order cost costing which is uh, quite different because many different products are produced in each period not only one unlike coca-cola that they only uh, produce bottled uh, beverages so here products are manufactured manuf manufactured to order the unique nature of each order requires tracing or allocating costs to each job and maintaining cost records for each job. Examples to this would be the Boeing or the aircraft, uh, Boeing e aircraft manufacturing, the Betel uh, International Large Scale Construction, or even Walt Disney Studio. So it's a movie production. They are job order. So comparing the process and the job order costing, we have here for the number of jobs worked under the job order, they have many. But then for the process, there is only a single product. For the cost accumulated uh, by the, the, uh, the cost is accumulated by the job because that is a job order. The process is accumulated by the department. Average cost computed still from the job order and uh, for, from the job in the job order and from the department for the process. So for the job order costing, we have here job order one, job order two, and job order number three. We have the direct materials, the direct labor, and the manufacturing overhead. But you see the manufacturing he overhead here is not in the arrow with the, the direct materials and the direct labor. So the charge direct uh, they charge direct material and direct labor cost to each job as work is performed. Okay, they charge this once because the work is performed by them. Direct manufacturing cost, okay, so we have here direct materials, direct labor, not anymore, but the manufacturing overhead is for job number one, job two, and job three. So the manufacturing overhead includes the indirect materials and indirect labor. So they are allocated to all the jobs rather than the uh, directly traced to each job. They are all directed to all the jobs. Manufacturing overhead then is applied to jobs that are in process. In ulit ko, manufacturing overhead is applied to jobs that are in process. An allocation base such as the direct labor hours, direct hour dollars, or machine hours is used to assign manufacturing overhead to individual jobs. So we use an allocation base because it is impossible or difficult to trace overhead costs to particular jobs. Manufacturing overhead consists of many different items ranging from the grease used in the machines to the production of the manage to the manager salary. Many times the manufacturing overhead costs are fixed even though output fluctu fluctuates during the period. So manufacturing overhead application, we have here the predetermined overhead rate or the POHR used to apply overhead to jobs is determined before the period. So to get the POHR or the predetermined overhead rate, we have 
do have the estimated uh, total manufacturing overhead cost for the coming period divided by the estimated total units in the allocation base for the coming period. So ideally, this one is the allocation base is a cost driver that causes the overhead for you to be able to get the predetermined overhead rate. Um, application of manufacturing overhead you know, be based on estimates and predetermined before the period begins okay, is the POHR. And then uh, for you to get the overhead, uh, you get the, the uh, multiply the POHR to the actual activity, which is the actual amount of the allocation based from the actual level of activ activity. And then you would be able to get the overall, uh, overhead applied. For the overhead application rate, we have the uh, this and as an example. Um, the estimated total manufacturing cost is $640,000 and the estimated total units allocation is 160,000 direct labor hours, the LH. So if you're going to divide these two, the POHR is the projected overhead uh, uh, our uh, labor uh yeah, overhead cost, sorry, is the is four point uh four point zero zero dollars per uh direct labor hour. So that would be the cost for each direct labor hour worked on a particular job, four dollars of factory overhead will be applied to that job. Uh, we have here job WR53 at uh, NW5 Inc. in Qua are required $200 of direct materials and 10 direct labor hours at $15 per hour. So estimated total overhead for the year was 760000 and estimated direct labor hours were 20000 What would be the rec uh, recorded as the cost of job? Uh, WR53. So this is the code. Would it be 200, 350, 380, or 37, uh, 730? And based from the given computation, you have here the direct materials, which is 200. The labor, $15 by 10 hours is 150. Manufacturing overhead, $38 by 10 hours, that's 380. So we have the total cost of $730. So the answer is letter D. Job order costing in service companies uh, is used in many different types of service companies. Okay, so uh, in here, job order costing is the procedure to accumulate cost when work is performed pursuant to an order to meet an individual customer specification. Example, uh, somebody um, gave, uh, I mean, brought a brought his car for repair so you have to uh, do the costing there so such a system can be appropriately applied to accumulate costs in the following situations like this auto repair shops automobile assembly printing shops foundries hospitals contractors machine shops and the like so job order costing is useful in uh, many ways, like uh, it can be utilized for estimating the production cost of specific jobs, estimates of future job cost, and then from the point of view of accounting, the system is easy to operate as the costs are recorded order for or job wise. Finally, job cost sheets, which are the focal point of job order system can be utilized by the management to segregate jobs on the basis of contributions or profits made by them. So most frequently replaced automotive parts. Okay, what are these? First one is the oil filter. Again, these are most common, meaning all the other parts can be replaced, but these are the commonly replaced parts. Okay, So no matter what type of model of vehicle you own, the part you'll need to replace the most is the oil filter. 
The lubrication system is vital to the proper operation of any internal combustion engine. So depending on the car manufacturer, how your vehicle's uh, lubrication system is des designed and the type of oil used, you'll need to get the engine oil and the oil filter replaced every 5,000 kilometers to 20,000 kilometers. Second one is the air filter. The engine air filter will also need to be replaced on a regular basis. Most car manufacturers, manufacturers will recommend the replacement around 40,000 km, but you really need to replace it only when it's dirty or clogged. Driving regularly on unpaved or gravel roads will greatly shorten the lifespan of your air filter. Failing to replace the dirty air filter will minimize the airflow to the engine and will re reduce your vehicle's fuel efficiency. Air filters are usually pretty inexpensive, so don't hesitate to replace it when needed. If you frequently drive off-road or live in a dusty or arid climate, Installing a wet air filter might be a good idea to save money on air filter replacement. This type of filter can be cleaned and reused indefinitely. Be warned that wet filters, unlike dry filters, need to be properly oiled to do the job. So a wet filter not cleaned, oiled, and maintained often enough will cause more harm than good to your engine in the end. So you still have to be very careful about using your wet filter. The third part is the drive belt. So belts should be inspected at every oil change and replaced as soon as surface glazing or cracks are de de detected. Since the alternator, water pump, oil pump, power steering, uh, unless your car is equipped with an electric power steering system, and AC compressor are, are all powered by the drive belt, your vehicle won't go that far without a drive belt in good condition working. Good working condition, I should say. Even though drive belts are manufactured using a rubber type specifically made to withstand the biggest temperature gaps possible, the rubber will end up drying out and will start to crack with time. So when the cracks are uh, big enough, the belt will loosen up and could uh, slip on the pulleys, producing a squealing sound. When it happens, failing to replace it in time could lead to the belt tearing up and ultimately bringing the car to a halt. Without a drive belt, the alternator cannot do its job anymore and the car will stop as soon as the battery is drained from its power. Next is the cabin filter. So cabin filters, also called the pollen filters, are used to clean the air entering the cabin from contaminants like pollen and dust. So a clogged cabin filter will greatly reduce the efficiency of your climate control system. There's no fixed uh, service interval for this part since it depends on the climate you live in, the kind of roads you travel onto, and the millage you drive every year. So most cabin filters are located behind the glove box and are easy to replace. Simply over uh, unhook the glove box, remove the cabin filter cover, and pull out the filter. Replacing a cabin filter takes a maximum of 10 minutes and most car dealers will often charge uh, over uh, $60 if it is in the U.S. in doing this one. So you try to compute it if it is in peso. Uh, probably it's uh, less expensive. Okay. Then you also have the brake pads and rotors. Right after oil changes and routine maintenance work, brake pads and rotor replacement are the most common job mechanics must perform daily. So brakes are used every time you drive your car. So you'll need to be replaced. Uh, they'll need to be replaced from time to time. When you step, uh, step on the brake pedal, the brake pads are pressed onto the rotors and slow down the car. The rubbing of both components on each other will lead them to wear out and need to be replaced. Furthermore, in the case of emergency brake situations, the rotor temperature will suddenly rise and could cause the rotors to warp. So warped disc brakes will make the brake pedal vibrate and will cause premature wear of the brake pads. To ensure your uh, brakes last as often as possible, make sure to have your brake system serviced every year or 24,000 kilometers, depending on whichever comes first. 
Next, we have the wheel speed sensors. So for whenever uh, an app's warning, okay, light is popping up on the dashboard, the problem is usually related to the wheel speed sensors. So these sensors are located on the knuckles, pointing towards the speed sensor rings installed on the drive shafts of the wheel bearings. Because of their location, they are constantly exposed to the outside elements while you drive your car. So they get filled with uh, uh, anything like uh, dust there and uh, water and dirt. Consequently, it's common to see rust infiltrating the sensors and damaging the inside components, leading to false readings and DTCs being recorded in the PCM. So you have to change them already. Next is the stabilizer link. So suspension components are constantly under stress. They have to absorb the shocks coming from all bumps and potholes on the roads. Therefore, it's only natural that these auto parts need to be replaced more often than others. So stabilizer links are by far the most commonly replaced of all the suspension components. This may or may not be true depending on the car model you drive. Car manufacturers use different link designs and some are simply more efficient and reliable than others okay then we also have the ball joints so ball joints are used to allow your front wheels to move on the vertical axis every time your car hits a crack or a small bump on the road the ball joints are solicited so ball joints are lubricated from the factory and the rubber seal is used to prevent water and dirt to enter after a while, the seal will dry out, crack the rust, and start to accumulate on the bottom of the ball joint, pushing, pushing the grease out. So water will also be able to enter and will wash out the remaining grease. So whenever it happens, the ball joint will become loose in the socket and knocking sound will be heard every time that the wheel hits a bump and a squealing sound could be heard when the steering wheel is turned. So there's a problem. It's saying that the, there is a problem with your ball joint, then you have to change it. Next is the control arm bushings. So these bushings are located at the other end of the control arms holding the ball joints. They typically don't include rotating joints like ball joints do and instead use polyurethane bushings to allow the arms to go up and down. As with other uh, rubber components, they tend to dry out and crack with time, so you have to change them. In most cases, when a control arm bushing is faulty, you should be able to notice the inside sleeve part sliding out of the bushing. When it happens, a low thump or metal noise will be heard when driving over potholes. Depending upon the car model, control arm bushings may be expensive to replace. Then we also have the shock absorbers. Uh, also called the suspension struts, are a little bit different. So unlike other suspension components mentioned before, they really need to be replaced because of water causing rust and creating a play inside of it. Instead, struts usually need to be replaced because they are leaking. So the oil contained inside shock absorbers is used to absorb the unevenness of the road. So when the uh, seals dry out, the oil will start to leak around the shock's rod and the oil level will gradually lower until the strut has no dampening effect anymore. So once the fluid level inside the shock reaches a certain level, you should easily not this, how the car starts to bounce an effect excessive amount of time after each bump on the road. To test it, shake the car while it's parked on the level surface and count the number of bounce after you let it go. So the normal suspension should stop the car from moving in one and a half bounce. Visually inspecting the shock can also help. There. Then we also have the inner tie rods and tie rod ends. So tie rods and tie rod ends do the same job as the ball joints do. If only they uh, that they allow the wheel to move horizontally instead of vertically. They are built following the same basic principle and thus are subject to the same defects like rust, yeah, which is the uh, most common culprit. Next is we have the spark plugs. 
On all internal combustion engines, it's the spark plug's job to ignite the air fuel mixture to make uh, create an explosion and ultimately make the car move forward. So spark plugs must withstand an enormous amount of pressure every time on explosion and an explosion happens. On a typical engine turning at 20,000 RPM, each spark plug will fire 1,000 times per minute and each explosion can produce a pressure reaching over 30,000 pounds uh, per feet uh, squared. The temperature inside the cylinder can also reach over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit right after the explosion. So as time passes, the center uh, extrude, electrode will wear out and misfire could cause. So this excessive heat can cause the insulator to crack and the faulty spark plugs will end up being short to ground and won't spark anymore. Then you have to change them. Next is the battery. So another frequently replaced automotive part, depending on where you live, is the battery. Cold is the number of one enemy a car battery simply because the chemical reaction inside of them proceeds more slowly in cold. Okay. After a while, as the plates degrade, the battery won't be able to hold enough power to allow the car to start. So such a situation will be exacerbated during the, the cold season and starting the car also requires more power than usual. And the last one, we have the alternator. As another main component of the changing system, the alternator also suffers from big temperature changes and is codependent of your battery, battery's health. So as your battery ages, the alternator will produce more power to make up for the battery's lack of efficiency and that often leads to premature malfunctions. Okay, basic maintenance procedure, check all fluids including engine oil, power steering, uh, then check the hoses and belts to make sure they are not cracked, okay, and then check the battery and replace if necessary, check the brake system annually and have a brake linings, rotors, and drums inspected at each change oil, and then inspect the exhaust system for leaks, damage, or broken supports, uh, schedule a tune-up to help the engine deliver the best balance of power and fuel economy. Then check the heating, ventilation, and the AC system. Inspect the steering, the suspension system, and shock absorbers. Check the tires, including the pressure and the tread depth. Check the wipers and lighting so you can see if they need to be replaced. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you again next time.